question, what is your love language? Have you heard of that? Uh, there was a guy who wrote a book and basically he talked about like there's these five love languages that everybody has. And, and basically what he's ba trying to say is like there are different ways that we communicate to other people and how somebody feels recognized or heard or loved. And that communication uh, is different for your personality or for who you are. Um, and so he kind of gives these five love languages. And basically what he says is this, is, is, is through the book, he, you know, you want to try to figure out which one's yours. And, and so Beck and I were doing this uh, years and years ago. And, and so my kind of top love language are words of affirmation, right? And so there you, is that you? Here you go. So words of affirmation, you know, so just, you know, once in a while, hey, I love you, babe. You're doing awesome. That was great. I really enjoyed when this, you know, this was helpful. The, those things like mean the world to me. They just feed my soul. And so I was like, okay, babe, what's yours? And she's doing it. She's doing a little test. She goes, oh, well, mine is gifts of service, like acts of service. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, what's that mean? Like, let's look into it, see what that's about. You know what it means, y'all? Doing stuff, <laughs> taking out the trash, fixing things. You know what I'm talking about? And I'm beginning to think about that. And I'm like, huh, I think in this relationship between the two of us, when we talk about, you know, who's bringing most to the table, you know, and I, and I get it, relationship, you know, you, you, you both have to kind of come together and sometimes one suffers a little bit more than the other, but I'm pretty sure I'm the one suffering because all she has to do is say, hey, babe, you look good today. And that's just like, yes, I have to go build her a house. You know what I mean? And I'm like, I'm pretty sure I'm suffering. I bring that up because we are in the middle of a series about suffering, but not just about suffering, but about the suffering servant, the suffering servant. Um, and in anticipation of Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday, I grew up calling it Resurrection Sunday. That's all right. Anyway, uh, we've decided to focus on the mission and the ministry of Jesus Christ to the world. And, and what we did was we are looking at these four songs that are in the book of Isaiah. And, the, and these are called the Suffering Servant Songs. And so each Sunday we're looking at one of those songs because all of them talk about this suffering servant figure, but each of them sort of depict this figure in a different way. Um, and so what our hope and prayer is in this season is that no matter where you are on your spiritual journey, that these songs would help you to know and to love Jesus Christ more. Um, and so this morning we are in Isaiah 50, and, and last week I uh, posed a question which was, has God forgotten? This week, I'm posing the question, has God let go? Has God let go? In, in other words, when difficult circumstances come, what does, watch this, holding on to God when it feels like God is not holding on to you look like? Holding on to God when it feels like God's not holding on to you. And what we're going to discover today is that Jesus actually went out of his way to risk his reputation and, and to create a scenario which included pain and sickness and sorrow and grief and even death and anger, all to ensure that you know that God is both aware and that God cares about you, about you. And so we're going to read this passage in Isaiah, and we're really going to be looking at three things. We're going to be looking at the servant, the source, and the suffering. The servant, the source, and the suffering. Let's read Isaiah chapter 50, starting in verse 4. It says this, The sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue. This is, the, this is the suffering servant talking. Has given me an instructed tongue to know that the word sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning. He wakens my ear to listen like the one being taught. The sovereign Lord has opened my eyes and I have not to be rebellious. I have not drawn back. I offer my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to have pulled my beard. I did not hide my face from the mocking and the spitting. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? 
Let's face each other. Who's my accuser? He, he's calling out the accuser. He's calling out the hater, right? He's calling, out, he, he's calling out the one. He says, let him confront me. It is the sovereign Lord who helps me. Who is he that will condemn me? They will all wear out like a garment. Moths will eat them up. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> who among you fears the Lord and obeys the word of his servant? Let him who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. But now all of you who light fires and provide yourselves with flaming torches, you go walk in the light of the fires and the torches that you've set ablaze. That is what you will receive from my hand. You will lie down in torment. Just a little bit of encouragement out there. Just so <laughs> felt like giving a little encouraging word this Sunday morning. This is God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we begin to feast on your word, that, Lord, it will help us to see you clearer, that we may embrace you deeper. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. amen. And so in, in the weeks following up, like I said, we're looking at the, the mission of Jesus, and, and we're looking at specifically this mysterious servant figure that's being prophesied about here in the book of Isaiah, and this figure has come into the world to bring the salvation of God. And the New Testament writers identify this servant figure as Jesus Christ, right? And, and so, and this third song really is not just about how Jesus is this servant, right? He fulfilled the prophecy of being the servant, but also how Jesus is the suffering servant. But he is the suffering servant in a way that you and I could never be. He is the servant of God. He serves God in a way that you and I could, could not. And, and through that, that means his obedience is in a way coming into Jesus, coming into God the Father in a way that we could not. He is not just the suffering servant, but he's the obedient suffering servant, you see? And so number one, the servant, the servant. It's interesting because these last few weeks leading up to now, we've been talking about this suffering servant and, and what that means for all of us. And, and what we need to understand is this, is that, is that Jesus Christ said that I came not to be served, but to serve. Not to be served, not to come in and, and, and say, hey, now you have to serve me, but I'm here to serve you. I didn't come here for you to come and meet my needs. I came to meet your needs. In fact, I came to meet your greatest need. The need beneath the need, you see. The need under the surface needs. I have come to meet that need. And th but, but also what I have come to do is I have come to show you how to live, right? Not just as an upgraded version of, of humanity, not just a human 2.0, but I've showed you how to be a completely different type of human. In other words, because Jesus serves, we serve. Yeah. We serve. We should be reflections of the servant. We should be pointing to the servant. Everything we do, our interactions and our thoughts and, and our behaviors should be doing that. Now, we don't do that perfectly, do we? And so we praise God for his grace and his mercy, that his love for us is not predicated on our perfection, but on his. Not predicated on what we do, but what he has already done. And so we thank God for that. But we are in many ways like his shadow, right? And so when you look at a shadow, you're seeing something that is reflecting an object, a person. And the shadow isn't the person, but yet the shadow looks like the person. I don't know how many of you have watched, uh, you know, Peter Pan, but one of the greatest parts in this scene is where Peter Pan goes uh, to uh, Wendy and, and, and Michael and John and to hear bedtime stories. And one night when he's there, he loses his shadow. And so he has to go back to get it. And, and so in this scene, he finds his shadow and his shadow starts running around the room and, and, and he has to chase it down and he ends up having to put it back together, right? What's fascinating about that scene is his shadow doesn't just look like him, but in many ways represents his character, right? That this shadow is youthful, playful, mischievous, loves to have games, right? Play games. In the same way, 
We are to be shadows. We are to be reflections. We are to point to Jesus Christ. We are to serve, you see. We are to do that. Now, now notice he says, listen, I'm, I'm making a model for you. Well, in what way? Look, in verse 5, it says, the, suffer, the servant of the Lord says, I have not drawn back. I have not drawn back. In other words, I have not chickened out. I am not showing fear. I'm showing courage. From what? Well, verse 6 says, from the mocking and the spitting, right? And then verse 7, he says, therefore, I have set my face like a flint. A flint is like, the, like a very hard rock. In other words, he says, I'm going to do what I have been called to do. I'm going to be obedient, and I'm going to be able to withstand this suffering. And the reason I'm going to be able to withstand this suffering is because he says that God is the one who vindicates me. He says that in verse 8. In other words, what he's saying is, my identity is in God. My self-regard is grounded in God. That's what it means to say that God is my vindication. His identity is rooted in God. And so, so the suffering or the criticisms, the circumstances, the opposition, uh, their opinions that ultimately won't destroy him, won't overtake him. He won't lose his composure, get worried or anxious, you see, because his identity is in God, is in God. I wonder what our identity is. Now, when I say the word identity because of the context we are in, that carries all sorts of meanings, doesn't it? All sorts of meaning. I love hearing and learning about sociology, culture, psychology, and, and basically how humanity thinks, how we behave, what influences us. And I was listening to a podcast the other day, and they were covering a, uh, a, an article that was written by The, Atlant and the Atlantic. And, and basically in this article, uh, it was talking about looking at America, America culture, uh, specifically American political culture, but culture in general, and, and, and was trying to give us some categories to figure out where we are now how you know who 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 are we exactly and and you know usually when we think of these things especially when we think of political culture we think of the left and we think of the right right there's left and there's right there's liberal and there's conservative um but what, what the, but what this article does is it also sort of gives us not just you know a left and a right but it also gives us sort of uh, these two ideals, these two philosophies or ways of thinking. One is modernism and the other is postmodernism or modernity and postmodernity. Modernity meaning modern, a mo what they call a modern way of thinking. And postmodernity means a response to after you know, after modernity, a response to this modern philosophy of thinking. And so as you could see on the screen, there's sort of the, these four quadrants. And so there's the, the left side, which would be considered liberal, the right side, which would be considered conservative. But, but see, even within the liberal and conservative camps, there's a modern way of thinking and there's a postmodern way of thinking. And what this article does, and what I was listening to this podcast, it was really fascinating, is they said, listen, there's really sort of these four American culture religions that have been set. Religions. And, and, and they use the word religion because the, these, these, sort of, uh, these sort of quadrants have really created like a sense of devotion. You're devoted to this group. This is, this is a group that you're devoted to, right? It brings like a social bond of expectations. And, and, and there's a devotion there. And these four devotions are kind of wanting to steal our devotion of Christ. And so the first one on the upper left is what he calls the religion of progress. The religion of progress. And there, th that creed is we can change the world, right? So these are like the Bill Gates and the Steve Jobs, the iPhone, Silicon Valley, Bruno, uh, you know, Sam Harris, uh, Bill Maher, right? And basically it's these ideas that, hey, civil look how great civilization, uh, civil civilization has come. Look how far we've gotten institutions, technology, reason, science. All of this are ways in which we can transform the world to make it better. And so, and so one way that, that the Atlantic article describes this is that this is smart America, smart America. 
And then on the conservative side of modern thinking, there's the religion of progress. The religion of progress. Oh, I'm sorry, the religion of responsibility. I apologize. Of responsibility. And here, the creed is, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, right? So it's kind of the classic, you know, Ronald Reagan, Newt Gingrich type of sense, a thing of, of responsibility, right? This idea that if we all are responsible for our families, for our jobs, if we just took personal responsibility, we could change the world. So you have people like, you know, Jordan Peterson, which, you know, if you, you, know you can change the world by making your bed in the morning. You have Ben Shapiro, Joe, Joe Rogan, Right? And this is sort of a modern way of thinking. And, and, and here you have this idea uh, about a free America. Free America. Free America. Interesting. And so that's sort of the modern way of thinking. And then when we move to the bottom half, you start getting into what is really postmodern. And the difference is this, if, 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 in very simplistic ways, the modern way of looking at the world is almost like think of a, a scientist with a lab coat wanting to sort of dissect humanity, bring in technology and science to save humanity, believing in the institution. Postmodern is opposite. Postmodern is almost think of the artist painting a self-portrait, an artist painting a self-portrait. Right? And they look at things like institution, reason, science, and they said, listen, those things have, left, uh, has, ha, have uh, failed us. They, they've only given us world wars and nuclear weapons and eugenics, all in the name of science and reasoning. And so now in postmodernism, there's sort of this high distrust of government. There's this high distrust of anything bigger, the bigger narrative, the bigger story. There's a shift, right? There's a shift. So in this bottom left quadrant, again, you know, kind of liberal thinking, but postmodern, is the religion of identity. The religion of identity. Still wanting progress, still wanting change, but, but, but not necessarily a trust in the institution or in science or in authority, right? So now the locusts have changed from the external to the internal. And so now here you look at yourself, you look within, you, you try to find your true self and express the authentic self of you, right? Personal identity. So personal, you know, so you have personality tests that just skyrocket and everybody's taking personality tests, right? Uh, strength finders, uh, what is that, Enneagrams, all, all of that, right? To, to find the real you, Right? And here you have like, you know, Disney, you know, uh, and, and all of the Disney narratives are, you know, find the authentic self and, and be that. Um, you, you have people like Lady Gaga, Little Nas X, you know, this performative uh, sort of self reinvention. And, 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 and here it's about justice. And so it's about a just America. A just America. So there's a smart America, a free America, a just America. And then there's still the conservative side of postmodernity. And this is what the podcast called the, si the religion of security. The religion of security. And its creed is this, good fences make good neighbors. It, it brings about this fence that there's danger out in the world. The, the world's a dangerous place, so we need boundaries and rules to, to, to conduct ourselves, to let the insiders know how to live. And so there's still deep distrust in government and institutions, right? But here the rhetoric is like, you know, the deep state is here to take away your rights. Big pharma is pushing, you know, uh, medicines and vaccinations on you, fake media, right? And, and, and in this, there's a high degree of loyalty that we need to band together. We need to stick together, you know, in our tribe. And so here you have people like Trump or Christian nationalists, Alex Jones, Oliver Anthony, right? Who wrote Richmond, the side of Richmond, I think that's what it's called. And so this, uh, and so this podcast and this article was trying to get us to, fi to figure out when you look at America, where do people fall? And this is sort of what they determine are kind of the four categories that somebody probably will fall in. And if you're asking yourself, well, which one do I fall in? It's probably the one that you're most defensive about. It's probably the one that when I was reading these, you want to justify why that quadrant is right. Now, you might be thinking, okay, that's interesting, cool. What does that have anything to do with the suffering servant in Isaiah? Everything. Everything. 
You see, when you look at these four categories, progress, responsibility, identity, security, progress, responsibility, identity, security, progress, responsibility, identity, security, these themes are actually theological. These are actually God-given values, all of them, all of them. You see them. See, in the Garden of Eden, we see progress, right? We see progress. We see responsibility. We see identity. We see security. See, uh, for progress in the garden, humanity is called to cultivate the garden, to cultivate it, to, 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 for there to be progress. And then from Genesis to Revelation, you see humanity going from a garden to a city garden, right? And the new heaven and the new earth are coming together. Heaven is coming down to earth. There's progress. There's progress. We see responsibility. Adam and Eve are given responsibility to work and take care of the garden. Adam is given the responsibility to to name the different species of animals, right? We see that coming in. We see identity where where humanity is created in the image of God. And that, that creation of being created in the image of God means that is your identity. That now humanity has intrinsic worth and value. In other words, if you take that away, if you say, no, we weren't created in the image of God, then you take away the fact that humanity is intrinsically worth something. Yeah. Intrinsically has value. You see that? And then there's security, where God is, is securing the garden, right? We see here where gender is sacred and, and they have intrinsic worth, but also that there's a security factor. Right? That God is ultimately the protector and the defender. So all of these are biblical themes. The problem is when you decide to camp out in one space and you decide to isolate one, right, and put it against all the rest, when you decide to uproot it, you know, and then you tether your identity to it and make that one quadrant ultimate, then that becomes an idol. That becomes an idol, you see. Because Jesus Christ, right, in many ways represents all of these categories and yet transcends all of them and transcends all of them. And we know it becomes an idol because what happens is when when somebody from another tribe or from another camp says something, you get defensive, right? You get angry, you get judgmental, you get self-righteous. And this is why, unless your identity is secured in Jesus, then you can't say, well, when circumstances come, they can't destroy me. Oh, no. They will change your character. They will change how you love your neighbor, you see. You, if your identity is not found in, in the suffering servant, then you can't say that nothing will make me lose my composure. I won't get angry or nervous or, 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 or worried or anxious, you see. When you aren't reflecting the suffering, the suffering servant, then your identity is not in him. And we're called to reflect him. We are called to serve others. And check this out. If serving is below you, then Christianity is beyond you. If serving is below you, then Christianity is beyond you. We say, okay, well, how, how do I do that then? How do I do that? Because I feel like my culture, my upbringing, society, the way things are going are all trying to force me into one of those categories. That, you know, the, this whole idea of just you be you. Well, no, culture doesn't really want you to just be you. What they want you to be is what they want you to be. And we feel like we have, to, we have to somehow confine to this mold. But how do, we, how, do we get, how do we get to be able to reflect Jesus so that way when we're going through suffering, it won't destroy us? Well, you do that by looking at the source. Number two, the source. Where do you get power to live like that? To live like Jesus? <clears throat> well, this text tells you. This text tells you. Look at this in verse 4. It says, The sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue, an instructed tongue, to know that the word sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning. He wakens my ear 
to listen like one being taught. That word instructed in Hebrew is the same word for disciple. It, it, mean, it literally means he's given me the tongue of a disciple, someone who is learning, someone who is a, a learner and a follower. You know, and a disciple listens to the words of the teacher and then wakens my ear. Well, wakens my ear to what? Well, it says to the word of God, to scripture, to scripture. In other words, this servant of the Lord is immersed in scripture. This is where his source is. Now, you might be saying, yeah, but I thought you said that was Jesus. It is Jesus. Well, if it's Jesus, that's Jesus. You know, of course he can do that. That's the son of God, right? I'm not Jesus. You can't expect me to be able to just endure like that. See, here's the crazy thing. And this is important to know as we're coming up to Good Friday and Easter. When Jesus came, he came as human. He took on humanity. And when he lived in his humanity, he never pulled out his divinity card. Right? He never said, hey, let me just show you I'm God. Nope, can't do that. Yeah. Right? He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. When you look at it, when, when he's in the garden, right, about to get arrested, he, he looks at his disciples and says, listen, I could call thousands of angels down right now and take out everybody. But he never does. He doesn't. Right? When he's being tempted in the desert by Satan, Satan wanted him to time and time again pull out the divinity card. Right? And say, hey, play it, play it. Turn these stones into bread. Throw yourself off the temple and let the ar angel armies come down and save you. Show everybody who you really are. He never does. When he's up on the cross, a high and respected religious figure looks at him and says, if you really are the son of God, take yourself down from there. Go on. Play your divinity card play it. He doesn't. Tim Keller says this, Jesus was immersed in scripture. See, Jesus doesn't play his card. What he does is he gives scripture. See, this is the secret of his power, Tim Keller says. This is a feature of Jesus' life that I just think gets missed. If he is the servant of the Lord, then that means we could go to the New Testament and find that Jesus is absolutely immersed in Scripture, trusts it completely, and, and is absolutely reliant on every square inch of his life and every moment of his working hours. And he says this, and that is exactly what you find. You see, when you go to the Gospels and you look and you, and you ask, well, what was Jesus' attitude towards Scripture? Well, we see that Jesus looked at Scripture as completely authoritative, right? Scripture has authority. In fact, you might be stunned to find out that he quotes 24 Old Testament books in his life here. Because And this is interesting, this is really important because I've had people say, Christians, professing Christians say, well, listen, when I look at, when I look at the Bible, I really only want to look at what it is that Jesus is quoted at saying. You know, some Bibles have like the red letters, right? They say, I just want, you know, what Paul says, what Moses says, ah, oh, that's nice, but Jesus didn't say that, right? That's what they say. And Jesus is like, what are you, are you kidding me? No, all of it are my words. All of it are the words of God. He uses it, he quotes it, he uses it as authoritative, meaning he believed that the scripture is God's word. If you go to Matthew 19, Jesus quotes and he says, listen, he says, a man shall leave his father and his mother and cling to his wife. What is he doing? He's quoting Genesis 24. Every time there was a crisis, every time he was betrayed, every time he was sentenced, every time he was abandoned, how did he handle it? He's the son of God, right? So how did he handle it? He quoted scripture. He quoted scripture, you know, he didn't, you know, do, you know, some sort of like, you know, magic Dumbledore type of thing and, you know, wave his hand and some crazy stuff. happened. No, he quoted scripture. You know, when he's on his way to Calvary and he's carrying his cross and the, the women in Luke come up to him, right? And they're weeping. And he says, daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves. What is he doing? He, he's quoting the book of Hosea. When he's on the cross and he's dying in the most excruciating pain, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What is he doing? He's quoting Psalms 22.1. Do you see that? 
when he's tempted by Satan time and time again, he says, it is written, it is written, it is written. Scripture, 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 scripture. And if that is the way Jesus Christ not only looks at scripture, but that is his source, right? In, when he is walking and living in humanity, not playing his divinity card, He's not using that as a source. So then what source does he have? He says, listen, as, a, a, as humans, let me show you what your source is. It's the gospel. It's the gospel. Are you under the authority of scripture? Or do you just kind of look at it and like some parts of it? Right? Do you, do, you, do you approach scripture like you approach culture and, and you say, listen, I'm going to decide what I think this should or should not say? Wow. Because we get people who say, like, yes, I, I, I believe in Jesus. I'm a Christian and I want Jesus in my life. But, you know, I, I don't know if I can really believe everything about scripture. I mean, really, was this man really swallowed up by some kind of like sea creature? Like, I don't know. Mm, yeah, I don't know if that happened. Right? Maybe, you know, or really, I mean, I mean, you have a whole people that are going uh, up into this city called Jericho and, and, and the way that they get these, this fortified city, these walls to come down is not through, you know, cannonballs or anything like that. No, they decide to get the band together, play some music and march around it seven times. <laughs> and of course, those are the, mo the, the more, the less insensitive parts of scripture aren't they oh because there's more provocative more offending verses that should absolutely offend us and if you read all of scripture and never pause and say wait a minute i feel kind of offended by what was just said what does that mean then you're not reading scripture you're just sort of i don't know brushing over it quickly to get your morning dose of the holy ghost or something you know <laughs> See, because either you're the one in the judgment seat deciding what parts of the Bible make sense and what parts don't, or the Bible's in the judgment seat over you looking at you and saying what parts of you make sense and what parts don't. See, when you read scripture, watch this, the heart posture should not be to master it, but for it to master you. Yeah. Right, write that down, yeah. right? When you read scripture, the heart posture should not be for you to master it, but for it to master you. So, you know, verse, th so verse 10 and 11 at the very end, what we were reading of our passage, it says like these weird things, right? It says like, who among you fears the Lord and obeys the word of the servant? Uh, let him who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord. They're like, wait, what is that about, right? And he says this, and, and now you who light fires and provides and provide for yourself a flame torches, walk in the light of your fires and your torches that you have set ablaze, right? You will lie down in torment. What's that about? What does that mean? Well, it means this. He's talking about this idea that we think we can be self-sufficient outside of him. He's saying, listen, if you're in the dark and nothing seems to be making sense and everything around you is a mess and all you see is chaos and pain and suffering and it's one problem after another after another and you try to light your own fire to see your way through, go ahead, do it. But it's going to go out very quickly and all you'll do is find yourself surrounded by darkness again. Depressed again, hopeless again, broken again, hurt again, sad again, confused again, don't know what to do again, utterly destroyed again. Again. You see, we need the word of God. We need the word of God. And if you're going to accept Jesus Christ fully, you have to accept the, his teaching fully. Why? Why? Well, because of number three, the suffering. The suffering. See, we, we can't just stop right here and be like, okay, let's end the sermon. Because if we do, then you might begin to think, well, maybe the Bible is like some sort of magic book. I can just, you know, turn to whatever scripture. And, and if I just chant that verse out loud, it'll magically do something. No, that's not how it works. You see, the reason you have to take it in as this verse says, morning by morning, day by day, being saturated and soaked in it and soaked in it, every chapter, every verse coming in a different way. The basic message is this. The more you understand the gospel, 
the more the gospel changes you. And notice what I said. It didn't say change your circumstance. But changes you. Changes you. You see. Let me give you a statement. And I want to give you this statement, but it's probably one of the most insensitive statements ever made in history. Probably. It's, it's up there. Maybe not Mo, but it's, it's up there. But I'm wanting to give it to you because it was Jesus who said it. And what I want to do is I want, I want to share with you a narrative that intersects with all of our lives, a narrative that if you have been attending church for some time, you, you're probably familiar with this particular story, which is this, is that Jesus is there with his disciples and, and a servant comes up to him that he recognizes, right, and approaches him and says, uh, and says to, to him, he says, listen, he says, Jesus, um, your friend, someone that you love very much is sick, very sick. And his sisters have sent me to come to you that you might go to him and you might do for him what you're doing for, for everyone else, what you're doing for strangers, people you don't even know, that you'll go to your friend and that you'll come and you'll, hear, you'll heal him. And of course he would, right? Of course he's going to get up right away and go do it. And so his disciples get up and they get ready. They start grabbing their bags. We got to get going. And Jesus says, wait, 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 wait. Jesus says, sit back down. We're not going. And he says, go back and tell him we, we, we're not going. What are you talking about? And Jesus stayed there for days and waits for his friend to die. Wow. And John, who was there, who's now documenting the, 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 this event, and, and, he's, and he's doing it for his readers, and he knows that, 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 that his readers, they weren't there. And so, so he's wanting to make sure that you understand what's going on because, because what you might think at this point is, well, maybe that wasn't really Jesus' friend. You know what I mean? Like, you know what I'm talking about? Like, you know how somebody like, yeah, we're friends, but are we friends? You know what I mean? Like, to a point, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, we're cool, that's it. You know, but the, uh, well, you know, maybe not. A little shady Jesus. <laughs> Is that what's happening? But John, John wants to make sure he says, so he, so he makes sure he adds this to, the, to this. And he says, listen, I want them to know this because this is so true. Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He wants you to know that Jesus loved him. Loved them. So then... Watch this. He dies. It says this in John 11. He just says, Jesus, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm, I'm going to go and wake him up. He says, oh, he's asleep. The disciples are like, oh, okay. Well, okay, well, that's not, I mean, that's not asleep. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? I know there's some people that are hard to wake up. My, my, my middle child, we have to pull her by the ankles every day. I mean, you can't, you can't shake that girl awake. Like, it just will not happen, okay? I don't care what it is. You can come and bang in pots and pans, whatever it is, and she will just, she's just, that's it. She is difficult to wake up. So like, oh, yeah, that's fine, Right? So they say this, they say this, well, verse 12, well, well, uh, well his disciples thought, well, Lord, if he sleeps, then, then he'll get better. He'll get better. So then he told them plainly, he's, no, 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 not kind of sleep. He says this in verse 14. Oh, you know, sorry for the miscommunication. No, Lazarus is dead. <laughs> Lazarus is dead. Wow. And then, and then he makes this really insensitive statement, Right? Because we have to know, well, what, what exactly happened here, right? What, what, what exactly is happening? In fact, in fact, the, uh, I love that this statement is there because it, it causes me to believe in the authenticity of the Bible. Because when, when people, when, 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 when you have, um, when you, uh, well, not professionals, but I'm trying to think of a better word than professionals. But anyway, when you have experts of, of ancient literature, one way that they determine if this is sort of authentic is, does the literature always make the hero look good? Or are there parts of, of this story that actually make the hero not look good, actually make the hero look pretty bad? And if there are, then they actually say that that's probably very authentic. Because if you're going to make this up, you're wanting your hero to look really good, not embarrassing, not shame. You're, you're not trying to get people to not believe in this hero. You're trying to get people to believe in them, right? You're not trying to like, you're, you know, you want to kind of cover up some of the stuff. But the Bible leaves it in there, leaves it in there. So this is what he says, verse 14. He says, then he told them, play, Lazarus is dead. And then here it is. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there. I'd like to say what? 
Yeah. Now, I don't know how he said it. You know, he probably said, you know, and for your sake, you know, calm Jesus, right? I, I'm glad he, you know, I wasn't there. That's not how I read it. I read it and saying, yeah, he's dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there. That's how I hear it, you know. And I'm sure at this point they're like, what are you talking about? You, you better have a really good reason coming out like, why? Why are you glad? You better have a good reason because while you were just sitting around, they were watching their brother die. And now you want to go to them. Now, now you want to go. Oh, now you want. Oh, now you're ready. Oh, you're ready now. Okay. So now you want to go there and face these angry women that are going to come at you because they are grieving. They are mad. They are brokenhearted. They are hurt, right? Okay, now you want to go, right? Why? Look at what he says. He says this, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe. You guys know Winnie the Pooh, right? And, and, y'all, and you know the characters of Winnie the Pooh, there's that donkey named Eeyore, right? And Eeyore's kind of a doom or gloom type of, you know, always kind of has these sort of, you know, kind of dark and depressing little sarcastic sayings. That come out. And everybody, well, maybe not everybody, but most people, you know, has at least one friend in their circle of friends that's like that, right? And for Jesus, it was this guy named Thomas. And so this is kind of funny because, you know, G- you know Jesus says all this and then Thomas says this. He says, all right, well, let's go then that we may all die with him, I guess. <laughs> See that in verse 16? And so you have to ask the question, well, what is so important? I mean, honestly, 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 what is so important, so important that you would actually let this happen? What's so important? What is it? What what is it that we have to believe? Well, before asking the question about belief, we have to ask this question. Look at verse 15 again, so that you may believe. Who is you? Well, of course, it's the disciples, but I also believe it's you. It's you, you see. Those of you who feel like your faith is being crushed by circumstances, who feel like you're holding on to God, even though it doesn't feel like God is holding on to you. Jesus said, I have allowed this to happen so that anyone that feels this way, anybody that feels like God has let go, so that way I can show you that far from letting go, God is holding on. Jesus said, I have engineered this heartbreaking scene to address our where is God when we need God circumstances. Where is God when we need God circumstances? When, when, when my kid needs you, when my family needs you, when my marriage needs you, when my sanity needs you, where, where, where are you then? See, and he says this is for you. For what? So you can believe. Believe what? Well, what happens next is amazing. Jesus is about to put an exclamation part mark on how you feel when you feel like God doesn't come through for you. He's about to not gaslight you, right? But he's about to affirm your feeling. But not just affirm it, but affirm it with no condemnation. (laughs) Y'all, you see? And so if you remember the story, right? So so Lazarus is dead and there's Jerusalem. Jerusalem's about two miles away from Bethany and all sorts of people are coming to to pay honor to Lazarus, because he was a well-known and loved person. So all these people are coming from all around, and, and Jesus shows up. And so Mary and Martha are in the house. Now, this is days later. We're talking like four days later. You know, Jesus shows up on the scene, okay? Four days after they've done, they, they've done everything. They've already buried him. You know, the, the, the stones are, like, it's done. You know what I mean? Um, and, and so there, the, there's, the, there's the, you know, the head, what is that called? The grave, whatever. It's done. Like, it's all finished, okay? Four days after that, you know, Jesus shows up. And Mary and Martha are in the house, and, and, and they know Jesus is coming, and Mary's upset. Mary said, I'm not even going to go talk to him. I don't want to see him. If I, if I see him, if I, I can't even do it. I'm not even going to say it. Martha, you got to go. You got to go. I'm not going to talk to him. So Martha goes out there, right? And Martha is just going and pouring herself out. She addresses it because Martha is hurt and crushed. And, and here's what Martha's thinking. I know she's thinking, listen, after, after everything we've done for you, we have supported you. We, we, we fed you. We've hosted you, right? We have put up with the grief of religious leaders after you. Our lives have been threatened because of you. We have given you everything. And the moment we needed you the most, you weren't there. You weren't there. Look at this one. She says in verse 21, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
translation, this is your fault. And in that moment, this moment is where their story intersects with our story. Because we know what this feels like. We know what this feels like, right? And for some of you to be like, well, God must not care. Maybe God doesn't even exist. I don't know if I really believe, right? And maybe for some of you, you've been coming to church for a long time, and you would never dare to say that out of your mouth because you don't want people to know. But inside your heart, you're like, oh, that's really hard. It's really hard. But Jesus is so brilliant because he engineers this scenario. He goes out of his way to create this scenario to make sure that it would include all of us, all of us, you see. And so if you remember the story, so eventually Martha do, Mary does come out and, and, and Mary begins to, you know, break down and, and, and all of this stuff. And so verse 33, it's, for th- verse 33, it says, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews that came along and they were weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And for those of you who might be reading it, might be like, well, Jesus, if you were that troubled, why didn't you do anything about it? And then after that, they actually take him to where Lazarus is buried. They take him to the cave, and there was a stone in front of the cave, and, and Lazarus' body is sealed there. And, and, and there, he sees the weeping, and then all of a sudden, the, 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 the short of, shortest verse in all of the Bible, and, and, and listen, when scholars were, were, were determining you know, these numbers to place in these verses, they felt like these two words deserved its own verse by itself. And I agree, because it says, Jesus wept. Why is that important? Because Jesus wanted them to see that he enters into their pain. See, Jesus was demonstrating that God is not a God that sits idly by outside of human suffering, but enters into human suffering. And then Jesus does something completely controversial and disruptive. He says, remove the stone. What? Can you imagine, like, let's just say, you know, a family member of your dies, and then, I don't know, you know, a week later, I come to the cemetery, and I'm like, hey, actually, you think it's cool if I dig them up? <laughs> You'd be like, what? Yeah, yeah, I got some show. Hey, guys, uh, shut right here. Yeah, I got to, um, you know, dig this up. You'd be extremely offended, right? And like, what are you talking about? Why would you want to do that, you know? And, and, and so Martha reminds him, right, listen, you're late, Jesus. You're not just a day late, two days late. You're four days late. And Lazarus has been in there. His body, his body does not look like it did. She reminds him of that in verse 39. It says, by this time, there's a bad odor, for he has been there for four days, right? And Jesus says, roll away the stone. So they do. It probably took him about, you know, an hour or so to be able to do that. But they rolled it away. You know, and then look what he says in verse 31. So they took away the stone. Jesus looked up to the father and said, Father, I thank you for you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. <laughs> but I said this for their benefit. For the people that are standing there might believe. For their benefit. Wow. The people that are navigating circumstances that are slowly crushing their faith. For, faith, for their benefit. You see. The people who are, who are facing something that feel too hard and too heavy and wondering if God cares for their benefit. Wondering if God hears your prayers for their benefit. Wondering maybe this happened because God's angry or maybe this happened, you know, because I did something wrong. Or, or, or maybe if I would have done something different, maybe if I would have done something right, things would have been different. Or maybe all of this is just children's stories made up to keep us in line. He did it for those for their benefit, people that are thinking like that, so that they may believe. Believe what? Well, it says here, I knew that you always hear me, but for the benefit of those people standing here, that you may believe that you, that they may believe that you sent me. In other words, believing in the gospel. Do you see that? That there was a God who sent his son, but not just any son, his son, but not just the son, the suffering servant. The suffering servant. So that we may believe. Believe what? Believe the good news of the gospel. And now we see how Isaiah makes sense. Back to our verse in Isaiah 50 where it talks about this in verse 6. He says, he says this, it's the suffering I've offered my back to those who beat me. My cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide from the mocking and the spitting. That happened in Isaiah. And you're like, okay, well, that was that that figure. Well, when did that happen to Jesus? Well, right here in Mark 15. 
Mark 15, it says he, that, 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 that they had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. That they put a purple robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. That they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews. Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, you see that spitting and mocking. And when they had done that, they took off the purple robe and turned out and, and tore off his, his, his clothes on him. And they led him out to be crucified. They led him out to be crucified. Isn't that crazy? That's the gospel, though. This is what he wants you to believe. That God loves you. That God loves you. That God loves you. And, and, and here's the thing that in, in, if you kind of intellectually know that, but, but what, what's in your head hasn't hit your heart, right? In, in other words, if, if, it, if it hasn't actually transformed you, to be a person that is tender and yet courageous, then your understanding of grace is cheap. A cheap grace, not a costly grace. A cheap grace. It's not a biblical grace that you're understanding. Because how in the world could you ever come to grips with somebody who has given himself utterly to you without you giving yourself utterly to them? And so if you delve deep into the scripture... Every day, every book, every chapter, you'll see Abraham and Isaac and Esther and Nehemiah and Proverbs and, and, and all of the books written by Paul and Daniel and Nehemiah. All of them is giving you a picture of this costly grace, this suffering servant. The suffering servant. And it's all there so that way you can see that, hey, when you suffer, Jesus Christ is right there with you. Would you stand to your feet? I wonder as we get ready to respond and we get ready to close. I wonder if there's anybody here today that resonates with any part of this message. And all I really would want to say to you is this, when you look at the cross, when you understand Jesus, know this, that not only is he there in your suffering, but that he actually took on the ultimate suffering, not just for you, but instead of you. Because see, the suffering that we endure, the agony and the pain and, and everything that, comes, that we endure is nothing in comparison to the suffering that he took on that we should have endured, Thank you, Jesus. that we should be enduring yeah. right now. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. The hell you feel like you might be going through is wow. nothing in comparison to what it is that we actually deserve. Jesus. Because he took on the ultimate form of suffering, not just for you, but instead of you. He is the suffering servant. Amen will be, that you, Lord Jesus, will be glorified, Heavenly Father, that you will be lifted up. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that today, Lord Jesus, we have just been able to see you more clearly. We thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you guys. I hope that you guys have an amazing week.